All right. Well, um, I am a big fan, as many of you may be aware of, of the author Malcolm Gladwell. I don't know how many of you are Malcolm Gladwell fans, but he also has a great podcast called Revisionist History. And, and I was listening to the podcast the other day, and he was talking about stories. Now, as a person who makes a living, I guess I should say, as a person who's been called by God to make a living by telling stories, I was very intrigued by what someone like Malcolm Gladwell would have to say about stories and the importance of stories in our lives. He began, actually didn't begin, but in this podcast, he suggests that there is a difference between anecdotes and stories. He says anecdotes conform to our expectation of what a narrative should be about. So an anecdotal statement is going to conform, like it it would be something like we expect this to happen, an anecdote actually gives an illustration that shows that this is true. But what intrigued me was that he said stories speak of a narrative that betrays our expectations. Now, if you've listened to Malcolm Gladwell or you've read his works, you know that he has a way of looking at story or looking at history or looking at events from a very different kind of perspective. And and as he articulated that, he said, "The, the, the, the good story betrays our expectations because we didn't see that coming. He said something earlier in the podcast, though, and and, and this is what happens. I don't know if you ever have this when you're reading a book or you're uh, maybe you're listening to a sermon or you're, you know, listening to a podcast or whatever it is. He said something and all of a sudden I realized I was thinking so much about the one thing that he had said. I had not listened to the last five minutes of the podcast. Y'all ever have that happen? Like you're reading something or you're listening to something. You're like, what what, what did he just say? Like, I I missed this whole thing. So I had to go back and and re-listen to what I had missed. But this is what he said that fascinated me. He said, the most important part of a story is the back end of it. Not how it begins, but how it ends. And he said, there is a difference between people and stories. Because when you meet somebody, you get a what? A first impression. And what does that first impression do? it usually sticks with you. But what he argues is that at the end of a story, that is what can make or break the entire story. How many of you have gone to a movie or how many of you have read a book and you get to the very end and you're like, can I have my time back, please? Like, it was such a dud of a way to end a book, to end a novel, to end a story, to end a movie, whatever it might have been. And so his whole point is saying, and this is a pastor, I'm thinking about this. He's like, you have to figure out that, or you need to realize you need to spend more time on the end of the story than the beginning of the story. That what people are going to remember when it comes to a story is how it ends. And then he also echoing in my brain is a great story that betrays our expectation, that something happens that we would never have possibly imagined could happen. And so I was thinking about that in the context of Colossians and and what we've been reading through, and we're about halfway through this sermon series on Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. And so I want to go back to last week, and now let me tell you something. I don't like preachers who are like, hey, I forgot a couple of points last week, so I want to go back and hit those points, okay? That is not what I'm doing this morning, okay? I'm just trying to make a point by this idea of story and what happens at the end of the story that sometimes we might just miss. So we are going to get, I promise, to Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, but we are going to meander our way there for just a couple of minutes, okay? So Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. This is where we ended last week, and and, and it talks about what happens on the cross. And we read this, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them. So watch this trajectory. Triumphing over them by the cross, he made a public spectacle of them. What I didn't have time last week to unpack was this. This is a military term. This public spectacle is what an emperor or king or queen would do when they had conquered a nation. 
And they would bring in the people that they had captured and they would bring in their treasure and they would bring in all the other stuff that these people had owned that was now no longer there and they would have a huge party. And the people of the conquering nation, guess what they would do? They would mock and they would laugh and they would point the finger at those people who had lost. So what is Paul saying that Jesus did? This is what Christ did to sin and death. He made a mockery of it. You see, there's a little twist in that story because what did people think was going to happen when Jesus died? They thought, you know, dead people, dead people are dead, right? Like, I mean, that, that's the way that thing usually works. So they never expected this, but not only did they not expect it, they also didn't know that one day they would have forgiveness of their sins, that they could have life and have life abundant. It's a story that betrays our expectations. It's a story that some people still have a hard time fathoming. And so that's how the Apostle Paul ends it. It's like, you know, if the Bible just ended at Genesis chapter three, blah, like that's not very exciting, but you get to Revelation 22 and there's this beautiful story of Eden being restored of life with God, that the light is in the midst of the world. And there is celebration because it's a story that ends well. And what the Apostle Paul does in his writing is he always wants the church to end well. He wants to write a narrative for them and help them to write a narrative where they continue to do the good work of God. But there is a problem. And this problem is called false teaching. And it's been going on since the beginning of the church. And so Paul is very concerned. We saw this alluded to last week in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. And I promise we're about ready to get to the text for this morning, okay? But we skipped right over it because it, it, it gets expanded in our text this morning. But I want you to see how all of this sticks together and holds together. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Make sure no one takes you captive through hollow teaching. And now we're saying, because if you remember if you were here last week or you're watching online last week and you're like, hey, Paul, you skipped that verse. I didn't skip it. I just didn't preach about it, okay? Because we're going to talk about it today. Because now in verses 16 through 23, Paul unpacks that hollow teaching. So listen for God's word. He says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not anyone, let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection from the head, with the head, from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ, remember this is the idea of being baptized with Christ, baptized into death and raised to new life. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. The Apostle Paul, throughout his letters, if you read them carefully, continues to argue against this idea that you need more than the grace of Jesus Christ. Grace plus is what people often call it. And Paul says we, we fall into this trap of the, the shadows. 
We're not dealing with the things of substance. That Christ is the substance, that Christ is the essence of God the Father, that, that, that he and the Father are one. But there is this shadowy world of the law and there is this shadowy world of saying, Jesus is great, but if you really wanna be saved, if you really wanna be the person that God wants you to be, in this instance, you need to follow the dietary laws. You need to observe certain days. Because if you're not doing that, eh, you're not really much of a Christian. And so Paul is like, hey, friends, uh, we already dealt with this at the council in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15, remember there's this arguing about what people could eat and what rules of Israel did the, did the, did the new believers of Jesus, did the new believers need to follow or adhere to? And they came up with their list. And the Sabbath was not one of the major ones that they came up with on their list. And the dietary laws were not one of those ones that made the list. There were certain dietary things, but they were not kosher. But what's happening in Colossae? Well, hey, you know what? You're not observing the Sabbath. Not really sure you're a Christian. Or you're not eating the proper food. Or you're not doing this. And so somehow your faith is in question. Now remember, the law is not a bad thing. Christ said, I came to fulfill the law. He didn't abolish the law. The law helped prepare us for Jesus and the teachings of the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, the 613 other laws that are there. You know, th those are all important, but they're not what brings salvation. The law cannot save, and the Apostle Paul talks about this. But we sometimes get caught up in saying, well, if I'm doing just the right things, then somehow God might love me more. Keeping the Sabbath. I remember years ago, and when I say years ago, I, I realize that years ago is, years ago when I, years ago used to seem like 10 years ago, right? So I was thinking, oh, that was like 10 or 20 years ago. And then I was like, oh no, that was 40 years ago, okay? So, so when I say years ago, it's when, like, when I was a teenager, okay? So that's like, that's years and years and years ago. So, um, so our family was visiting some mutual friends we had in Scotland. And they were good Scottish Presbyterians, so if you think Presbyterians in the United States are uptight, do not worry because Scottish Presbyterians are way more uptight. These Scottish Presbyterians, these friends of ours who we were staying with, were strict Sabbath keepers. So what that meant was on Saturday, they prepared all the food. And on Sunday, the only time, that the only place they could drive to was to church. But these friends of my parents had a dilemma, and that is that people from the United States who did not observe the Sabbath like them were visiting them and wanted to see the countryside on Sunday. But they didn't drive on the Sabbath. So what did they have to do? Well, they had to get pagan Uncle Eddie, right, to come on over and drive us around the countryside of Scotland because they were going to keep, I don't know if his name was Eddie or not, I just made that up, I don't remember that. And I don't think he was a true pagan, but he was a pagan in the sense that he did not observe the Sabbath, right? And therefore he was looked down upon. But it was fine for him to drive us around the countryside. What Paul is saying is sometimes this, this uptight law keeping gets in the way of relationship and gets in the way of this beautiful grace that God wants us to experience. So he says it's not grace plus one or two more things. He also warns about the experience factor. Now some of you may know other believers like this, perhaps this may describe you as well, so I will try to not point the finger too much at that, if that is the case. But it is this, so Paul brings up this really weird thing about the, 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 the worshiping, like angels worshiping and angels worshiping of God and, and what does that mean? So the, the conjecture is this, is that in Colossae, there were people who were saying, if you truly want to know Jesus, you must figure out a way to worship him like the angels do. And guess what? We have figured it out. And until you worship like we do, guess what? Eh, your faith is a little bit questionable. 
We see this in other certain areas of the church about have you spoken in tongues? Do you pray in tongues? Do you, have you had this kind of experience? Have you had that kind of experience? And what that does is it puffs us up because we're like, hey, I've had this encounter with Jesus. And you really need to experience the same exact thing in the same exact way. Sometimes people do this with their testimony. Like there are people who have had these really rough, difficult years where they've been like the prodigal and they've gone away from God and they get up, and, I, and I've talked about this before, and they talk about their testimony and they spend 90% of their time telling you about the dregs that they were in and then give you about 5% of the gospel and the God who has changed their life. But our stories can be, kind of, because you know, I have friends who, who are like, I never walked away from God. And somehow when I hear things like that, I think, well, is my story not as good? Because I don't think we all have to have a story like that. So we have to be careful of this idea that our experience somehow helps to validate us even more with Jesus. Because it puffs us up. Now, the great example of people being puffed up comes from Luke chapter 18, the story of the Pharisees. Verses 19 through 24. Uh, where am I? Verses 9 through 14. That would, I was like, we're not talking about the rich man. Okay, 9 through 14. To some who are confident of their faith, of their own righteousness, to some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. He's like, God, let me tell you how good I am. Let me tell you all that I do. Let me tell you my experience of you. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, Jesus said, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Do you see the betrayal of the expectation in this story? The expectation is that, of course, Christ would delight in the religious leader because he was tithing, he was being faithful, he was observing Sabbath. The experience of his life would make one think that he was worthy. And Jesus says, guess who went home justified? The one who beat his chest and said, I'm not worthy. That is the one that went home justified before God. Because it wasn't about him bragging about his experience. It was him recognizing that he needed the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. That was the only thing that could save him. Because the law is a shadow. The law is important. But it is not Jesus. So the Apostle Paul continues on to that church at Colossae and says, look, I, I'm concerned because I know what's going to happen. I know the path of the church. Sometimes I laugh a lot because I'm like, why did Jesus give us the church to carry forth his message? Because the church has been a mess from the very beginning, right? Isn't there something better? Or perhaps maybe it's just the beauty of the church where we all recognize that we are sinners in need of a savior. That if we approach life with humility, the humbleness of that tax collector who said, I'm not worthy, and yet God says, yes, 
Yes, you are. So, so the Apostle Paul argues, he says, you're going to get going in your faith. And then there is going to be a temptation that as God leads you, that you're going to fall back into old patterns. You're going to fall back into those patterns of works-based righteousness. You're going to fall back into those things that you are comfortable in. Because transformation happens, but it's really hard to continue to maintain that. Because we are creatures of habit. And so Paul says, be very careful. Because there will be people who come along who seek to lead you astray. The Apostle Paul puts it this way when he writes the church at Galatia. Galatians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. He says, look, you were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. You were running a good race. This is the story of Israel. They're not running a race, but they're walking a race. They're walking towards the promised land. And all of a sudden, life is not going their way. And they're not seeing God how they want to see God. And God's not behaving how they want God to behave. And what is the temptation? Hey, we want to go back to Egypt. Brilliant. Because slavery is so awesome, right? Like for 400 years, let's go try. Well, at least we had food to eat. But you weren't heading to the promised land. Someone cut in on you and is taking away the goodness and the grace. This whole text that we're looking at today happens because there are those who've come into the church in Colossae and say, have said, you need to try a little harder. Jesus actually is not enough. And I know you and I are like, yeah, 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 that would never happen you know, here, that, that we know Jesus is enough. Yeah, right, we do know Jesus is enough. But sometimes, like, we're like, but Lord, um, and, and maybe you're not like this, but, but I'll share out of the, the shallowness of my own heart, right? Um, I'm like, I'd like a bigger mansion, you know that whole story that when all is called up and we go up and there's all these rooms prepared for us, right? And it's like, what does it take, Lord, to get a bigger mansion? Do y'all never think like this? I don't believe you, but that's okay. <laughs> or you've never thought about this before. You're like, hey, I'm just happy with a mansion in the sky. Like, I'm just happy to be with the Lord in the, whatever room he's prepared for me. But it's like, and I, and I say that very jokingly, obviously, but, but there is this sense of like, isn't there a little bit more? Don't I need to, to, to kind of keep pace and keep moving? And this is what Paul keeps pushing in on, of saying simply that Jesus is enough. You see, churches are really good at doing this. Because what do churches do? Well, as churches begin to grow, guess what? We, we offer more and more programs. We offer this, we offer this, we offer this, we offer that, we offer this. And we always are on the move. And I'm not saying this is bad, but I'm trying to make a point here. So I was talking with a group of pastors the other day. And we were all sharing, every one of them, there's probably six of us, seven of us in this, in this conversation, of how much harder it is to pastor the church to today than it was during covid And we were trying to figure out why. I mean, because COVID was kind of a disaster. I don't know if you remember that or not, but I mean, it was kind of a pretty traumatic series of months for a lot of people and for the church as well. But we were like, why, why is that? And finally, one of them just said, it's because we're exhausted. We have come back with every program that we have ever done and we've added more. Remember we all, when we were going through COVID and everybody said, oh, we're going to change. We'll never be like that again. We're going to slow down. We're going to appreciate life. And what has the church done? We've gone from zero to 100 in a matter of months, saying we've got to catch up. We've got to move fast. We've got to add stuff. But perhaps that's not right. And perhaps that's part of what Paul is arguing about. 
Because the common theme around that table was people in ministry are tired. And I don't know about you, but when I get tired, I think I can outsmart my body that if I go to bed a little earlier or sleep a little bit later, that's all gonna be good. I, that doesn't work for me. Maybe that works for you all, but I've just never discovered that that works all that well. So I was thinking about this. I was thinking about Psalm 127. This is kind of where I want us to land today. Verses one and two. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For God grants rest or sleep to those he loves. You see, I think the Apostle Paul is looking at the church and saying, are you really abiding in Christ? Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says, come to me all you who are weary and I will give you rest. But the problem we have and the problem our culture has and the problem the church has had is that we want to keep striving. We want to keep adding on to. Instead of just looking at our lives and asking the question, am I abiding in Christ? Or am I doing all of these other things that somehow don't fully satisfy? And in that, I'm missing the beauty of just being with Jesus. Because I hate to make it that simple, but it is that simple. But the problem is the world, the church, others around us, it'll all start pulling on us. When I think what the gospel is saying, so are you finding rest in Jesus? Are you trusting him to be enough? And yes, you're going to do other things and you're going to serve in other ways and you're going to have all these other sorts of things, but they cannot become the primary thing of your life. My experience is not primary over who Jesus is and his love for me. So this morning, we're going to come to this table. And I feel like worship is, it's such an important element of our lives. And whether people are watching online or whether people are here in the room, it's, it's an hour that we actually get to get away from all the noise and simply come and be reminded of who God is. Because unless if the Lord is building our lives, we're going to labor in vain. But God's great desire is to grant us his peace, his joy. And the Apostle Paul is saying, don't ever forget that. Don't allow these other rules and regulations to take hold of your heart. But make time to simply abide in Jesus. Pray with me, please. Lord, we come to this table. And this table is a reminder to us of where we find rest. Lord, as we sit, as we reflect, we're grateful for a Lord who sits with us.
who calls us to the table, Lord, no matter where our hearts are. I mean, Lord, you, you had Judas sitting at the table with you. And yet you still welcomed. And Lord, sometimes we're working too hard. We're doing too much. And we need to simply rest in you. So as we receive these elements, God, would you feed us? Would you sustain us? Would you remind us of the forgiveness that is ours? And would you help us to trust in you? We pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. So we celebrate this sacrament, this visible sign of God's invisible grace, this reinterpretation of the Passover meal, this place where Jesus defied expectations. And now we as a church for some 2,000 years almost have been sharing in this, talking about what this bread and this cup are all about. And so we remember then the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks to God in heaven, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. And in the same manner, after dinner, Jesus took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so the gathered church has remembered as often as we eat this bread, we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns again. We will spend some time now partaking of the Lord's Supper. If you did not receive a packet as you walked in the door, if you just raise your hand and we'll have ushers who will bring you the communion elements. Let us now receive the Lord's Supper.